Back here on the Cover 30 Podcast, every single Wednesday, we like to take you inside a matchup. Locks is where you get the best bets. But if you want real context, if you want analysis on how these games are going to be decided, well, we got to give it to you in Big Game Breakdown. There's, there's so much packed into Tennessee's visit to Oklahoma. It is the Oklahoma Sooners SEC opener. They've got it at home. They've got it at night. It is Josh Heupel returning to Oklahoma 10 years to the season from when Bob Stoops decided to let him go and then the following year hire Lincoln Riley. We have a Tennessee team that looks like an absolute monster. We have an Oklahoma team that certainly is imperfect, though 3-0 and in the standings. And all of it's going to come colliding on Saturday night. Uh, let's we, we were off field for a lot of minutes, so let's, let's start on field before we get to the Josh Heupel revenge factor. Danny, what do you think Tennessee can do the best against Oklahoma? I know a lot of this is going to be about Nico and Josh Heupel and that offense, but I think the biggest advantage they have is probably their defense against <laughs> Oklahoma's offense. Well, I agree. Like Jackson Arnold has not looked comfortable yet for the Sooners. Um, they've been a little bit banged up. They have not clicked. And Tennessee has those – they got – Dudes on the defensive line that can absolutely get after a quarterback. That to me is the biggest edge in this game. So one thing that stands out to me about the defense is that the offenses that Tennessee has played are not intimidating. But where's Oklahoma? Like Oklahoma will be the best offense that Tennessee has faced. But by how many, like, but by how many tiers? Based on Oklahoma, like raw talent, top end talent, sure. I mean, you got Jackson Arnold, you got Deion yeah. Burks, but in terms of like one through eleven, the way that they handled their business, like, is this enough of a jump up in competition that we should expect that Tennessee's defense is going to be anything other than really, really salty? I mean, look, I, we don't necessarily know that Tennessee's secondary is is all that improved. Um, I mean, in, NC State, McCall uh, got injured against Louisiana Tech, but if he did not get injured, I think he was heading for a bench. He had played poorly in that ball game, and he had played poorly against NC State, and he had played poorly against Western Carolina. So uh, they really have not faced a competent passing game yet. We don't actually know how good Tennessee's uh, pass defense in terms of coverage is. I do think that we know that Tennessee, that their D-line is going to absolutely rip. Against um, Oklahoma in this I, I, NC State's offensive line has been disappointing, but – so has Oklahoma's. And most of that, I think, is due to poor evaluation in the transfer portal and then injury, uh, subsequent injury. So they, they've had sort of the the double whammy. Uh, Florida State fans know that well this year. Um, so Oklahoma's kind of got the same thing going on. And there's a reason Houston is abusing you, right? Like Houston's got a, a nice defensive scheme. Shieldwood does a good job there. But that shouldn't happen. I mean, Tulane got some pressure. <laughs> you know, Temple... Temple sucks, but like Temple got a little more pressure than I thought. Uh, it, I mean, I, I I bet OU in that game, I had to sweat it like kind of, and thankfully Temple's <laughs> offense is just like that bad. So, I mean, can they block Tennessee at all? I, I think they'll probably have to run Jackson Arnold a good bit in this game to even up the numbers in the run game, and then try to take some of your deep shots. I, I, I mean, short fields, turnovers created by ten by, by Oklahoma's defense, which is really damn good, is going to be important here uh, because I just don't know how many points Oklahoma can score. I will note, after screwing around with the helmet comms and stuff in week one, I don't know if, if Venables got into that offensive meeting room and said, hey, like, y'all ain't that smart. You slowing down gives the, gives the DCs an opportunity to, like to, to call stuff too, crank that tempo back up. But they have fully throttled that tempo back up in the last two weeks. So I would expect OU to try to go insane tempo just like, like Tennessee is again. I mean, I, I, I do think the key to this game will be Oklahoma's offensive line versus Tennessee's defensive front because there's very much a lot of truth in the idea that Tennessee hasn't faced a good team yet. So it's hard to know 
how good the defense truly is and how legit some of these statistics are. But statistically, it's it's been pretty good. It's been like, awesome. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like Oklahoma, it looks bad for Oklahoma. But as far as the entire country is concerned, it's not terrible. Like they are 63rd in pressure rate allowed and they are 61st in time to pressure. Again, not great. It's basically exactly middle of the road, but it's not like it's been awful. And to their credit or to his credit, Jackson Arnold has done a very good job of getting rid of the ball. Away. So he's, whether that's just because he's terrified, sometimes that game, sometimes it's just because he's getting rid of the ball because he's good at it. But what will be remain to be seen is that this is a Tennessee team that on the other side of the ball ranks seventh nationally in time to pressure rate as far as getting to the quarterback. And what really stands out about that is Tennessee's not blitzing to get the pressure. They are just bringing four guys nearly 90% of the time, and they are still getting pressure. They rank eighth in pressure to blitz ratio, which is just a way of saying they can blitz or they can get pressure without bringing extra bodies. So considering some of the struggles Oklahoma's offensive line has had in pass protection, that's something to worry about. Then I also think that Oklahoma is going to have to be able to run the ball a little bit. And I wonder if for me, from what I have seen from what I've, and I have not broken all this down and studied it, but from what I have seen, the offensive line to me has been a bigger problem in their run game than pass protection. They haven't been good in either, but I worry more about their performance creating space in the run game. And I think that's going to be a problem because if I'm facing Tennessee, like, bud, you're right. They have increased their tempo. But I need to stay on the field, too. Like, I do not want to send my defense out there repeatedly to face this Tennessee offense who can, you know, just put up explosive plays and can move pretty quick on its own. It can also just wear you down. And one of the problems the Sooners have had is they are currently, they've gone three and out on 41% of their offensive possessions. Yeah. That ranks 122nd. That is terrible for a team that is supposed to be that good. So your defense is getting worn down. Your offense is not getting any kind of confidence. It's not getting any kind of I don't know, momentum, whatever the hell you want to call it. So the offense needs to stay on the field. They need to be able to run the ball, and they need to be able to protect Jackson Arnold. If they can do all of those things, which is asking a lot, this is a game that they can win, and they can beat Tennessee. They are home. It's not like the Sooners suck. They're just not elite. And you look at this Tennessee side, like they do seem to be pretty damn elite, particularly on offense. And again, the schedule been very light, but they have decimated teams. They have scored on 76.3 of their possessions. <laughs> that is the highest in the country by far. Their negative play rate of 19.8% ranks seventh nationally. The one area that you can get them is as good as they have been. They have turned the ball over a little bit. And right now, Oklahoma currently ranks eighth in the country in defensive turnover rate at turning teams over. So that is the one thing. So if I'm putting together a recipe for the Sooners to pull off this upset at home, contain big plays on defense because Tennessee can get them either way. They're particularly in the run game. They have been just explosive after explosive after explosive. Um, protect Arnold, force turnovers, and stay on the damn field. That's how Oklahoma wins this game. Can they do it? I don't know. Which of these numbers? seems more incorrect to you or more correct, whichever one you want. Oklahoma, 24 and a half points, Tennessee, 33 and a half points. Those are the current team totals in Vegas for this game. 33 and a half. Meaning you think it's too low? Yes. I also think the other one's a little too high. <laughs> if, I mean, if Tennessee, if Tennessee gets over 30, I think they win the game like 90% of the time. Mm-hmm. If for Oklahoma to win this game, I think they need to really just have a defensive effort for the ages, which they might. Like that's a really damn good defense. They're to me, they're a lot more athletic than NC State is. Like NC State is a well coached defense. NC State to me does not have dudes. Like like next level difference makers. The corners are good, but everybody else is just kind of whatever. So Oklahoma has a lot better players. I think they can run with Tennessee more. I think Venables will have an awesome game plan, and I do think the home field is going to matter here quite a bit like it, it if you're just betting like betting like straight power numbers and giving like the normal two for home field i think you're doing it wrong in this game i think you need to be using like they're gonna be crazy jacked up for this like the first sec ball game ever this is the biggest home game for oklahoma since when uh when did maybe when ohio state came in or ohio state which one was more recent and this is probably bigger it's like it's your conference opener with with a new league right 
Yeah, like, uh, they don't get good games at home. Like they, their Texas game is always a neutral site. Like everybody who comes there, unless it's a non-conference game, it's not a draw. You know, so it's. I think the home field is going to matter an awful lot. Like we haven't seen Tennessee deal with pressure all that much, um, but I think Tennessee will have a good plan. I mean, they mm-hmm. the, their use of the tight ends against NC State was a surprise. I think to to me, to NC State, to everybody, and that worked out really well. Also, this is like Nico's first real road start. Yeah. In like a bad play. Like they played NC State and Charlotte, but the neutral side, and it wasn't exactly like I mean, those games are never really any that you're like worried about a QB dealing with the noise. You're going to have to deal with the noise in this one. So there's a definitely possibility young QB could make mistakes. Like I said, the, there have been turnovers. Like last, you know, he's thrown some bad throws against NC State. He threw a couple bad picks. If you can get him into doing that by pressuring him or just kind of confusing him, you can keep yourself in the game. So it's like the the concern I have if I'm Oklahoma is based on what I have seen, I feel like I have to play a perfect game to win, mm. whereas Tennessee could play a less than perfect game and still win. I think that's, yeah, I agree. What about um, Samson? Samson? I mean, like, <laughs> you want to talk about numbers that are, are funny. Hey, Nico is only throws it about 22 times a game. Now they're always blowouts, so there's no need for him to go out there. But like Nico, you know, this this superstar, and I'm, I'm not saying that he is not living up to the billing. I'm just saying they haven't even like truly unlocked or asked him to dominate this game. Dylan Sampson's got a profile of one of the best running backs in America. I got I, nine touchdowns on the year. Like I I could see this being a spot where if Tennessee can run the ball effectively with Dylan Sampson. You take the pressure off your young quarterback. You take the crowd out of the game. And while they're playing at like a blitzing pace, you at least are able to, if they are able to run the ball effectively, they you are putting a lot more pressure on that Oklahoma defense to be able, which I agree with you, bud, like is very different in terms of the athleticism of the players out there. But that you are asking them to win the game to begin with. You are always dealing with the threat of what Nico Iamaliava can do. If if you can't force them into those third and long, Nico, go make a play against this rowdy crowd and our nasty defense and whatever Brent's got cooked up from this week of gr- grinding tape, um, then it's it's going to be night-night if Tennessee can run the ball well. Preseason, we regarded this Oklahoma receiving core as, as good as any in the Big 12. or Sorry, in the SEC, right? Burks, Anderson, Farouk, Gibson, like that's a nasty foursome. Now it's just Burks, right? Right. And what is it? Anderson? Sorry, I the names are, are jumbled up in my head, but one of the guys is trying to get back and, and be a hundred percent. But we know it's not Gibson. Um, and the tight ends have not been as good as as I think that they had hoped they would be. You you would read a lot in the off season about how the tight ends are going to be more involved, but they have not really been difference makers. Um, yeah. So they're just banged up. Yeah, to your point, Deion Burks has caught 22 passes. No other Oklahoma receiver has caught six, more than six. Like, Bauer Sharp is second on the team with 10, and he's the tight end. Like, it is pretty much a one-man show at receiver right now, which was not expected coming into the year. And I think the other thing we learn about this game, or from this game, is how much Brent Venables trusts his secondary. Because, like you mentioned, Chip, Dylan Sampson's been running all over, but... It's also been facing a lot of light boxes because <laughs> defenses are terrified. They don't want to put extra guys in the box because then Tennessee will kill you. So is he going to leave his guys on an island? Is he going to put more guys in the box to try to stop that run to keep them from doing that? Because, you know, you think of them, that veer and shoot, you kind of think of it as an air raid. But the truth is it's all kind of based off the run game. Like everything they do is running the ball and then they get tons of explosives in the passing game. So It'll be interesting. Does he dial up extra pressure? Does he bring more blitzes? It's You're going to find out a lot about what they actually think of their defense in this game. What's really interesting, too, is the pace of this game because I think Venables clearly wants to try to confuse Nico. You want to try to mix things up. But when they're coming so fast, it's really hard to do that. Like, all of a sudden, you don't have – and I know you have headsets, too, but – it just gets a little bit more complex to try to get the blitzes that you want, the looks that you want to disguise, to do all those things. It's why teams go no huddle. It's why they go fast. Cause you figure out, bam, that's their base call or that's their check. If they don't know and they can't get a signal in or they can't get the call in. And then all of a sudden you can be exposed in a really tough spot. That to me is going to be really fascinating. I will point out 
just because those numbers Tom pointed out were spectacular for Tennessee. Chattanooga is 0-3. Kent State is 0-3. They're a 49.5 point underdog to Penn State. And NC State, I don't think is anywhere as good as a lot of us thought they could be. Mm-hmm. So, But we're like, this is the best part about this part of the season is we find out what teams really are. And I still think Nico's really good, and I still think Tennessee is really good. But I do think the environment, although I will say this, I don't know who's like, Tennessee, are they more confident than Oklahoma is as less confident? Like Oklahoma fans, it feels to me, are like, oh, I hope we don't get embarrassed. You know, I don't think that they're uh, they're even kind of down. Come kickoff time, that place will be like you. Oh, they'll be loud. Yeah, it'll right? be. There's a nervous energy about the Sooner fan base that's kind of like, hey, okay, this is the SEC. This is what we signed up for, right? Okay. Well, part of that too might be that. And who are the biggest twist the knife coaches in college football? Like oh, the guys Heupel. who know the number, James Franklin and Josh Heupel, Lane if Kiffin can, too. Yeah, yeah. If they can cover for the boosters, they will. So, I I don't think Tennessee lets off the throttle here if they get up. I mean, if they're kicking on sides at thirty to nothing against Kent State, they're definitely going to do any whatever it takes. Dude. I mean, they could be up by four touchdowns. They might pull out a fake punt. I mean, you just the, don't know. The, the opponent is nameless, is faceless. Speech <laughs> is just. I mean that. Uh, the, there's there's a there is a level of how about this Danny to answer your question there's a level of confidence I don't know about the fan base the confidence level in Tennessee's locker room seems like it's sky high like I I don't know and you know it was like I told you on CBS Sports HQ yesterday both of these teams have not trailed for a single second of the season and yet everything looks hard for one of them and everything looks easy for the other and while Tennessee's had one of the most uh, manageable uh, strength of schedules possible. It's not like Oklahoma has like Oklahoma has been playing down and things have looked difficult. And so I, I totally understand why there might be that different level in the juice um, going into this game. It's crazy how the head coach who used to be a quarterback just wants to score every time he has the ball. Who would expect that kind of mentality from a QB? Okay. One, one last piece here. Do we, we think Hypo wants this like as badly oh, yeah. as any game. Yeah. Like, maybe more than like, like, what would you rather do beat Oklahoma and Norman or win an sec championship? I mean, you can still get to the playoffs. So you would trade, <laughs> you, you got the <laughs> yeah, win over right. OU. Like who can, and we get a bye week going into the playoff and a home game. Heck yeah. He'd trade that in a heartbeat. I mean, and, you and probably Brent, can't do one without the other. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And then like Brent actually, like, oh, he admitted it. He like came out today and retold the story about how he didn't want to recruit Josh Heupel. But then he followed it up with like, oh man, I'm sure glad we did. Look at what, you know, we accomplished. But like, also Brent, what about that first part where you didn't want to recruit Josh Heupel? Okay. Also, well, like, Kaylee Smith was pretty good too. So I, I, look, I, <laughs> I, I'm like, I put myself in Josh Heupel's shoes. All right. And I took that personally. So on and so forth. Uh, all right, any other uh, thoughts on this game? I'm sure we'll uh, continue to discuss it from the wagering perspective on Thursday's Locks episode. Didn't, um, anything? Didn't Bob Stoops demote Brent Venables so that he could make his brother the D coordinator in a disastrous decision that probably cost him a national title? Which season was I it? would ask Bob, but he's not taking questions this week. Yeah. Bob- I mean, like, yeah, like Bob Stoops fired Josh Heupel, but he also demoted Venables, which allowed Clemson to get Venables when Steele had the issue and they, they allowed 70 points to West Virginia in, in the orange bowl in 2011. Yeah. Okay. 2011 God. season. Maybe we've been so doing this a long time. Josh uh, and so Brent like, just me to get midfield complaining about Bob. Venables kind of got to be like, Hey bro. Uh, I mean like he kind of fired me like pseudo fired me too. Right. Like, like <laughs> Josh, you're not the only one here who, who was, uh, who was done wrong. Yeah. Um, we, again, we will have much more on this 